That's right, it's time for another slow chat. My name is Topher Field, and for the second week running, this week's slow chat is brought to you by Brew, brewaustralia.com. I've just dropped the link into the platform wherever you are watching. That's right, I have sponsorship. That's right, it's my own company. And those of you that know the story of Brew, you know that what I'm trying to do is create a company that can support not only my work, but the work of all other freedom-friendly content creators that are out there. If you want to know more about that, I've done a slow chat about it previously. It's the same episode where I interviewed Nigel Farage. I interviewed Nigel for about 25 minutes at the start and then talked all about Brew after that. You can go back to that slow chat, find out all about what's happening with Brew, both the coffee itself, the quality of it, it's organic, it's specialty grade, the way that you make it, which is very, very unique and very, very cool. And also then the strategy in terms of what it's going to do for people who are trying to find a way to make what they do financially sustainable as a freedom-friendly commentator of some type. I've been doing this game for 12 years. I've managed to finally get onto a semi kind of okay, stable financial footing thanks to things like hoodies and t-shirts and cinema showing ticket sales and things like that. Finally, for the first time in 12 years, I'm actually, you know, I'm covering my costs. I'm actually, I'm more than covering my costs. It doesn't really pay for my time yet, but I'm on the way there. There are other people that we've discovered their talents in just the last two years as they've come out of the woodwork commentating around COVID, et cetera, and they're a long way away from being financially sustainable and we need to give them a pathway to get there. And that's what Brew is all about. So go back and watch that slow chat about that. If you would like, John, thank you for saying hi. Good evening to yourself. Karen, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. And uh, Daniel already said g'day. Good evening, Daniel. Harps is asking the big questions. Uh, what's on the drinks menu tonight? Will you be disappointed to know? I'm actually just sipping on a, uh, a 2021 Pinot Grigio. Um, I'm driving to Ichuka tomorrow with the family. I am a little bit of a madman. We're going on a five-day working holiday, I guess you'd call it. We're doing four cinema showings of Battleground Melbourne in five days in four different towns. And um, we're doing it as a driving holiday in a normal-sized family sedan with two children, a pregnant wife, and a 12-week-old puppy. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going to be having a bit of an early night tonight. Um, Michael Angelico, good to see you at the showings, Michael. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, Michael says, I don't have a cigar, but I have donuts and Balinese vanilla coffee. Balinese coffee was challenging for me when I first had it, but I actually grew quite accustomed to it. I started to like it after a little while. Joe, g'day. Diane, g'day. Um, Bruno you're a, says, Tofu, you're a farmer at heart. Lots of work just to cover your costs. Yes, uh, and it is, it's a work of passion. So, you know, same as farmers, I guess. We, we do it because we love it. Um, uh, Ethan says, was on page 260, 260 of Internal Combustion Engine Fundamentals by John B. Hayward. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt that very important reading of yours there, Ethan. Uh, Daniel, looking forward to seeing you Sunday, Arvo, as well. Be aware, I am booked Sunday night, so it's going to have to be an afternoon cigar, mate, after you win at your hockey match. We'll see you there. Uh, Renata says, road trips, yay. Uh, Judy, hello, Rod, hello. Okay, what's going on tonight? Tonight, I'm going to be playing you a pre-recorded interview with the American meteorologist, Anthony Watts. Now, I interviewed him nearly a decade ago for the 50 to 1 project. We talked briefly about that in the interview, so I won't go any deeper into that. But this is a, a coming back to re-interview him. He's a very, very intelligent man and has done some very, very intelligent things and has ended up at kind of the center of a couple of international shitstorms as a result, let's just say. And uh, I find him fascinating to talk to. I find the way that his mind works is fascinating. He's just very methodical and does his thing, 
tries not to overstate his conclusions. He's, 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 he could be accused of being boring, but I actually find him fascinating as a result of that just methodical, cautious approach where really once he, once he makes a finding, it's, um, it's pretty hard to refute. And that's what makes him incredibly, incredibly powerful. Um, Heather, see you on Sunday as well. Uh, yes, there are tickets still available to Echuca and to Shepherd and go to my Facebook page, uh, Topher Field, and you'll find a post there um, in the last sort of day, in the last 24 hours, that'll have the links. Uh, Echuca, I believe you can book online, I was told, but I actually thought you had to go to the, the cinema itself to book. But yes, there are tickets available for both. Um, yes, I am a glutton for punishment, but you know what? The election's not going to wait for anyone. So if we're going to do it, we've got to do it now before the election and get people to watch Battleground Melbourne. Um, yeah, the, the Murray is very high at the moment and, um, yeah, a lot of damage being done, but, uh, anyway, that's a, that's a story from the first 10 years of my time as a political commentator. The last two years have been completely taken over by, you know what, right? So there are cinema showings, go to tofafield.net, click on the very first blog post and you can find out where the remaining cinema showings are. Uh, and you can book tickets if you'd like them. If you can't afford tickets, please send me an email, tofer at toferfield.net. I'll give you tickets. It's not a problem. Just let me know that you need them and which showings you need them for. Be aware, in addition to the showings that are already shown, it looks like we're going to have a showing in um, Horsham and a showing in Mildura. Uh, and there may be a couple more to come out of the woodwork yet as well. But we're just, as, as demand arises and as opportunity arises, we're adding more showings and we can do that because we've sold enough tickets at the existing showings that overall as a project, we've broken even now. So we can take a few risks, book a few more cinemas and just hope that tickets continue to sell, that we continue to break even and then we can just continue to keep this process rolling and get as many people as possible to see Battleground Melbourne. One more thing before I go to the interview with Anthony Watts, check your emails. If you're on my email list, if you're not, go to toferfield.net and sign up. If you're on my email list, you'll have an email from me today that has a flyer in it for you. It's just black and white. It's designed to be printed at home that you can print and either cut up into three. It's the same identical flyer, three of them, and put it in people's letterboxes or just sticky tape it up on power poles, light poles, that sort of thing uh, so that people see it. It has the QR code for Battleground Melbourne. And this is part of our campaign. We want you to get involved. This is for you just to grab it, print it, and, uh, and just start sticking it up in your area. Uh, and uh, and that's going to be a really, really important part of getting more and more and more people to see that, that Battleground Melbourne exists because the biggest problem we have right now is most people don't know that it exists. So if you can check your emails, if you haven't got that email, send me an email, tofer at toferfield.net. I'll forward to you that particular document and you can print that at home. Uh, there have been some very good reviews of showings. Um, the, the most amazing thing about the showings, it's the same movie as you can watch for free at battlegroundmelbourne.com, completely free there. And um, it, what, what, but watching it in that group environment is just really powerful. And a lot of people are finding it very therapeutic. Uh, it's, yeah, it's very, very powerful for them. Um, Fred, I did not know this. The Pastoral Hotel in Echuca refused the mandates. I will try and have dinner there tomorrow then before the showing. The family aren't coming all the way to Echuca. I'm dropping them off in Shepparton and then I'm returning to Shepparton tomorrow night to sleep there. Um, but I will try and drop off at the Pastoral Hotel to have some dinner tomorrow night. Um, lovely. Okay. Without further ado, would you please enjoy? It goes for about an hour and a quarter. It's pre-recorded. I am going to be putting up people's comments and, and so forth as we go, uh, but it is pre-recorded, so I can't change the questions that I ask him based on your input. But please enjoy an hour and a quarter with the most read blogger on the subject of climate change that the world has ever seen, uh, a man that I have tremendous respect for, and this is my second ever interview with him. Enjoy one and a quarter hours of my interview with Anthony Watts. Anthony Watts, how long has it been? It's got to have been the better part of 10 years, I think, since we had our very first chat. Yeah, it just seems to be about a decade, yes. You know, it's, uh, but then again, it just seemed like yesterday. It, it, it does. And I have to say, it's really quite funny. This, for me, feels like a bit of a homecoming and, and a little bit of a, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, because 10 years later, the work that you were doing that we were talking about back then is more relevant than ever. Uh, I I had thought that 10 years would be long enough for sense to prevail. But sadly, here we are um, <laughs> still battling our way through the same the same issues. Um, but can I just say, and, and I was just saying off air, but for those that don't know, um, Anthony, you were quite hard of hearing the first time I interviewed you. And and you've had some, some hearing aids. I still have a hearing issue, which can, is can you, why I'm wearing headsets. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you give us an insight into into that sort of journey for you? Because there's a lot of people, obviously, that live with various uh, challenges. 
you lived with that one and you were very successful. You were a television broadcaster in spite of that growing issue. Well, um, I'll, I'll let yeah. you know, seek it. When you're a television broadcaster, particularly a television meteorologist, all you have to do is talk. You don't have to listen to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I, I think I might have missed my calling. I think I think maybe that's what I should do. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, you know, I, I picked up um, hearing loss uh, in late, or actually early adolescence to late adolescence, and it was due to drugs that were given to me when I was an infant to treat a hear, uh, ear infection in the outer canal, and it was tetracycline. The tetracycline mm -hmm. at the time they didn't know it was ototoxic, and so it resulted in uh, long-term hearing loss for me. And um, so, yeah, I get along well now. And, you know, there's all kinds of wonderful uh, new improvements in technology that people can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the most wonderful piece of technology happens to be my Google Pixel 6 phone. Believe okay. it or not, they have a built-in live captioning that works for phone calls, it works right. for videos, and it works for in the room. You can turn it on in the room and it will caption people talking within the room. Wow. That's both scary and impressive. <laughs> um, I guess you could say that. And 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 just full disclosure, this was not a paid advertisement for the Google Pixel. Um, <laughs> no, that's that is. I hadn't even thought about that. We're, we're getting. You, you, did, were you ever a fan of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams? Um, not familiar. Douglas Adams. Okay, he, he's a, It was a series of books that are kind of absurdist um, comedy books. They they they've mm. got a cult following. I've I've read all of them. Um, essentially, the Earth gets visited by aliens and one of the Earth and destroyed, and one of the Earthlings ends up traveling. Oh, so it's a universe. documentary. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the pieces of technology that the aliens have is this thing called the Babel fish, which is an actual living fish that can talk all languages. And if you just let it slither into your ear, then you ah. can talk across all language barriers. And I just, when I see things like what you, what you were just holding up there, I mean. It won't be long, and maybe it can already, where it could be captioning foreign languages in real time. It, it does um, it now. Mind blown. It's, 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 it's nuts. It's so cool. But here's the depressing thing. Our technology is amazing, but I don't think we've gotten any smarter. And I think your area of work is, is one of those areas where you're really pointing out some pretty significant flaws in, not in the, well, in the technology, but largely in our implementation of the technology and our trust, our unquestioning trust in this technology, rather than taking a skeptical view. One of the things we talked about 10 years ago, thereabouts, was your incredible surface stations project. And I'd, I'd love to kind of start where we where we finished last time, because that project has been ongoing. Uh, you've had a tremendous amount of support from your own community. You, Anthony Watts, for those that don't know, runs the What's Up With That blog. And uh, was at one time, possibly still is, I don't know, the most viewed uh, blog on the, the that way. climate change. No, still no is. other, no other website about climate or blog about climate has come close. Yeah. So there you go. You are the you are the ten year reigning champion. Maybe a lot more. I don't know how long it had been by the time I I got that stat. Um, and you ran with the help of many of your supporters and readers this thing called the Surface Stations Project. Can we kind of start at the beginning with that? What sure. was the problem you were trying to solve in the first place, and how did you go about it? Well, when I was at Purdue University, I was uh, working for the meteorology department. I was their meteorological technician while I was mm. going to school there. It was part of a work-study program. And one of the first projects they gave me was to set up a remote weather station site for the university. Okay. And they, un uh, they had me unpack the equipment and so forth. One of the things they had me unpack was a, a thing called a Stevenson screen which is basically a wooden box with slats. It looked like a chicken coop on stilts. And <laughs> I unpacked it. And there was this whitewash material, this, white, this chalkish material coming off in my hands. And I went to my professor and I said, look at this thing. This is horrible. The, the quality on this is terrible. Can't we get something else and repaint this thing? Because, I mean, it's just it's coming off on my hand. It's not going to last. And he says, no, no, don't, don't change that. That's special because they used that that whitewash all the way back to the beginning back in 1890 when the weather bureau set up the network of weather stations that was what they used whitewash from the tom sawyer days and they didn't yeah. want to change I mean, it. it makes sense right they didn't want to change it because it would change the characteristics of the box in response to sunlight and infrared and all this stuff oh all right i won't touch it i'll just be careful with it and that that stuck with me mm. about 30 years later i 
wanted to find out, you know what? I wonder whatever happened. Do they still paint those things with whitewash? Or do they use something else? You know, so I started asking around. I wanted to know if they had changed them, what was the difference? Mm. And, and that, that's what really got me into this thing. It was just curiosity. Um, no, it was not a giant check from Big Oil that showed up on my doorstep. It was just plain curiosity. Listen. <laughs> Listen, if I had just 1% of the amount of money that I'm accused of having received from all sorts of big interests, <laughs> I I would not be I would not be blogging from the outer southeastern suburbs of Melbourne in a single story house. I can tell you that much. Yes, I know. That just it's it's bizarre <laughs> the belief system that they yeah. have. But anyway, so that was what got me started. And so I started looking at weather stations in the area around where I lived. And I went to one uh, at the university the Chico State University, they had one, and it looked all right. Um, I noticed, though, that it had been repainted with latex paint. Mm. And so I made some photographs, marked that down, and then I went to the next one, which was about 30 miles west in a town of Orland, and it also looked okay. Um, but um, the, 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 well, let me back up a second. The one at the, at the Chico State University farm actually had a radio transmitter inside of it and a solar panel next to it and it was mm. transmitting the temperature data back to the weather service and that kind of raised my hackles because i thought why would anybody put a piece of electronics inside the box with mm. the temperature sensor because mm. electronics generate heat right yeah so I, yeah. I thought that was kind of odd then i went to the one in orland and it was a hey, okay no problems well, i thought oh, maybe that one at chico state was a flute and then i went to a, the next closest one which was marysville california Mm. And um, to use a term that uh, I think the British and the Australians use, I was gobsmacked when yeah. I saw it because <laughs> this was a sensor. Uh, it wasn't a box. It was a round, uh, what's called a uh, an MMTS sensor, which was the new modernization thing. Yeah. In the middle of the parking lot behind the fire station, the fire chief parked his vehicle right next to it. The radiator from the vehicle was literally about two or three feet away. Hmm. And there was two cell phone uh, buildings, uh, equipment buildings. They had, the city had rented out a cell phone tower space there and behind the fire station. And there were these two buildings full of electronics that had these air conditioners on. And I was getting warm air blowing past me onto the sensor. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is where you measure climate? You've got to be effing kidding me. And that was the light bulb moment because I had now had two out of three stations that I visited within a short radius that mm. had problems, one with a radio transmitter inside and the other one in a parking lot mm. with the fire chief radiator tr from his truck right there. Mm. It made no sense. And so that's what switched my interest from the paint over mm. towards inspecting the stations. And yeah. then it just grew from there. Now, you were in a pretty unique position and, uh, and you know, I'm very thankful that, that you had the idea and that you were in this position to do this. You had the blog already, is my understanding, and you you had some. Uh, I was just doing a basic of... science blog. I was just doing sure. things science thing. Sure, and um, and you were able to reach out and and w was it a, a project to start with, or was it just a conversation that happened? Like, how did how did it go from you noticing these things locally to actually people running all over the United States and Canada and so forth, photographing and documenting all of the the weather stations? Well. Um... I don't exactly remember how it transpired, mm. but I, it may have been I was doing an internet search. I can't remember whether I was introduced or whether I found it myself, but mm. I found a study that was done by Dr. Roger Pilkey Sr. from the University of Colorado. And yes. he had looked at some weather stations in Colorado, and he found some of the same problems that I had found. Mm. And I was intrigued because, you know, California, Colorado, the same kind of stuff with the same weather station network, gee. Mm. So I called him and I started talking to him and I explained what I'd found and he talked about what he had found. And it was sort of like, well, has anybody done this on a national scale mm -hmm. to look at all the stations? And he mm -hmm. goes, no, nobody's done that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then all of a sudden I thought, well, you know, it, it's just time for somebody to do that and I'm the guy to do it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just that simple. Yeah, yeah. So. You ended up getting a small army of people documenting, photographing, documenting. And this was this started, if my memory serves me correctly, the first iteration of the, the Surface Stations project began in, I think, 2007. That's correct. So this was before you could just jump on Google Earth and have a look and, and, and sort yeah, of get and, and, the lie of the land. 
Exactly. It was very difficult to locate the stations back then because mm. um, the database that the Weather Service had for them was just very generic. We had uh, lat longitude values down to just two decimal points, which can, mm. you know, in the United States, that gets you maybe within a mile and a half, you mm -hmm. know, and um, the there was just no good documentation. And we misidentified some stations sometimes because mm. we found something else close by, thought it was it, you know, so yeah. it was really tough. But here was the interesting thing. They did have a basic database uh, operated by NOAA at that time. Mm. And we were using that database. We advertised that we were using that database. And we explained the project and what we were doing. And then NOAA all of a sudden shut the database off. Seriously, with, within about three weeks of us starting the project. And I'm like, mm. what? At first, I thought it was a technical failure of some kind. Then I contacted them and they said, well, we are concerned that you and your volunteers are going to start encroaching upon private property and trampling things and, and, and getting into people's you know, lives and all this kind of stuff, you know, and you're going to violate privacy. I mean, there's a whole laundry list of worries that they came up with. And this is why we closed the database. Actually, they didn't close it completely. They just restricted the location information. So. I'm like, okay, well, how do I fight this? So I thought about mm. it in a couple of days, and I thought, you know what? I'll bet you there's some other way I can get around this. So I started doing some searching, and I didn't find a way around it, but I found out that the Weather Service and NOAA had been hypocritical in their concerns over privacy. Mm. They published a monthly newsletter for the Cooperative Observer Network, where not only did they have the photographs of the stations, and the name of the person and the person photographs right in front of the stations and their address, you know, they had all these things and they were worried about us going to photograph stations. And I said, look, you can't pull this off in, in the court of public opinion. You can't mm -hmm. say we can't go find the station while you're also out there publishing the faces and yeah. addresses and everything else of these people. Yeah. All we want is to picture the stations. We don't care about the people. Yeah. So they, they were put it back online. Okay. So you then have all this information coming in. Uh, people are taking photos, but as you've as you've sort of said, you know, there there are there are some real quality control challenges. You're dealing with an army of volunteers with different levels of competency, um, different levels of enthusiasm, or, or or potentially even a level of zealotry, where you know there is the risk that they may not be being entirely honest with you as they as they're pursuing. They want to see a certain thing, or they want to see things a certain way. How do you control for that um, as time goes on? Because I know obviously the project did evolve as time went on, technology improved, etc. But why, I guess what I'm getting to is why should someone take the results put forward by the Surface Stations project seriously? How can we have faith in the results? Well, initially, the photographs that we obtained of stations were so shocking that it spurred a lot of interest and a lot of incredulity. Um, you know, there was... Uh, people were initially saying, some people on the science community saying, well, you're only photographing stations, you're not out there measuring temperature, so you're, you know, you're not doing anything useful. Yeah. And um, here's the reason why you sh the, the original results had a value. At a, when they actually, back at the Weather Service, we found this out from the Climate Gate emails, not mm. from like, the Climate Gate emails, for those of you that don't know, happened in, no in November of 2009. And a whole bunch of emails between the bigwigs and the climate research community were exposed where they're talking about, you know, suppressing publications. They're talking about getting editors at, at uh, science journals fired. They're mm -hmm. talking. One, one guy even said, I'd like to go beat up this other scientist in a dark alley because he published something he didn't like. This kind of stuff was going on. But we found out in the Climate Gate emails that they had actually recognized that they had this problem. Noah recognized this problem way right. back in 1998 wow. but they they didn't do anything about it nine years before you started the surface stations project they already knew they had this problem right wow. so initially they didn't do anything about it then they decided that we're going to create a new network mm. and this new network is going to be perfect right and so they did that it was called the u.s climate reference network mm -hmm. of which 99.9 percent .9 of the people watching this program have never heard of and it's because they never publicized it and so yeah. they created this perfect network with triple redundant electronic sensors, well sighted away from any kind of human influences, asphalt, concrete, any of that stuff, 
way out in the country. Uh, they had radio communication sending the data back automatically, totally mm -hmm. automated, totally state of the art. And they put this thing together with uh, 114 stations in the United States, which was, they said was all they needed to measure climate change in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then they started collecting data. And then uh, in 2005, they actually put it online. You can find it. It's well hidden within the NOAA website, but it's there. And you can get the data. And so they recognized that they had a problem. They started creating a network to do it. Mm -hmm. So the next logical question is, OK, so if they created this perfect network, why aren't they using it? Why have mm -hmm. I never heard of it? Mm. Well, the reason is, is that the data that it produces does not fit the narrative. <laughs> it, it, the, the warming rate in the United States from this particular set of data from these stations is, is very low. It's not mm. anything like the corrupted stations that are out there that are next to the asphalt, the concrete, uh, automobile exhaust, jet mm. exhaust, mm. I mean, air conditioners. I don't know if anyone's uh, ever looked at the initial report, but the 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 worst example of a station, and this was by people who should have known better, was at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Mm. You talk about being gobsmacked. This was outside of the Atmospheric Sciences Department at the <laughs> University of Tucson, right? University of Arizona in Tucson. They had their weather station in the parking lot in front of the building, and there were cars parked into the side of it. They had a chain link fence around it. And this was an official climate station that had been operating since 1870 something. Mm -hmm. We publicized that and it got a lot of press because it was like, these are climate scientists, they're supposed to know better. And <laughs> within about a month or so, that station was quietly closed and no one told yeah. anyone. Yeah, wow. So what you observed and what I learned when I interviewed you way back in the day has stayed with me ever since. And I've, I cannot, stop myself from seeing so many more examples of very similar things i'll give you i'll give you two quick examples from australia number one and, and you're familiar with this one there is a, a pathetically sighted weather station in melbourne uh that is literally on the, it's in amongst I, i've been to that station region. it's on the triangular corner direct on a triangular corner with with i think it's about four lanes each way road on one side uh and then high-rise buildings and a wind funnel formed by the the the, the formation of the high-rise buildings i mean you just Yes, you are not it's right measuring. across the street from the city park, which is nice and green and lush. Yes, there is a there is a lovely park across the other side of eight lanes of traffic and trucks. Uh, that's true, um, but it just it, that and I used to notice that and and shake my head at that long before I ever got interested in politics or or science or atmospheric science or anything like that. It, it just stood out to me. It's just this absurdity, uh, and and I've, everything that I've learned since has only reinforced that view. But the other example yeah, that I've I will come say across, this. To the BOM's yeah. credit, they did take that one out of the climate record. Okay, well, that's at least something. Um, but in my travels around, so I've been doing a lot of work on a part of Australia called the Murray-Darling Basin, and particularly looking at the, the distribution and the regulation of irrigation water through that particular part of Australia. As, as part of that work, I headed out to Menindee, uh, which is a place quite remote in inland New South Wales. And I saw while I was there, I saw the apparatus that they use to estimate evaporation from the Menindee Lakes. So the Menindee Lakes is a water reservoir and not far from the lakes, <clears throat> they have, I kid you not, a corrugated iron drum that is about yay deep or um, might be a bit deeper, about, you know, about a foot and a half or, or so deep. Yeah, it's called an evaporation pan. And it sits above ground level so that the sun is actually shining on the sides of it in addition to the top i don't know if you've noticed but dams don't tend to have exposed sides that the sun is right, shining they, on. they tend to be they tend to be down um and of course being such a relatively shallow uh low volume of water it's uh, its thermal mass is quite a lot lower and uh, would be more prone to a more rapid change in temperature um and and yet this was this was the official way that they had decided that the evaporation off the Menindee Lakes was some phenomenal some phenomenal value an extraordinary value and based on that information they then made policy decisions that were hurting quite a lot of people, and I'm standing there looking at a rusty corrugated iron drum, in the backyard of a of a building, just a residential backyard essentially, and I'm just looking at this going this is the best we can do. And and we are making we are making decisions that are destroying people's lives, right? Off the basis of what is really a very poor representation of a natural or even a a, a man made dammed lake system. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you something about those evaporation. Pans. Please do. 
because they're all over the Midwest and the United States, and they have two big problems. N number one, they are exposed to sunlight, and they're not cleaned every week, so they develop algae, mm. right? And so the algae itself absorbs more sunlight, which heats the water more, which causes more evaporation. So it's a right. vicious cycle. It's, it's a positive feedback. The other thing is, is that it, because these things are water and because a lot of them are just out in the field unprotected, they're a popular watering trough for many animals that make it in there. <laughs> So you're you're measuring what the local what the local bobcat population drinks, not to... right, right. Oh my God, the water is disappearing. What are we going to do? It's climate change. But and this was the and you know what I'm going to do it again. I keep on mentioning this book, um, but it's it was such a powerful book. So you, I, I doubt you would have heard of it, but you may have. This is by Professor Ainsley Kello from the University of Tasmania in uh, in Australia. Mm -hmm. Science and public policy, the virtuous corruption of virtual environmental science. So he's talking about computer modeling and that sort of thing. You, a lot of your work is more oriented around the physical. Um, but this idea of virtuous corruption, or, or I would call it virtuous laziness, where people say, well, I'm working on saving the planet from climate change. And therefore, I don't need to be as rigorous and as skeptical of my results. If the results are what I expect and we're showing a high rate of warming, well, that's what we expect. Oh, a high rate of evaporation. Well, that's what we expected. And there just seems to be this attitude from so many in this particular sphere of atmospheric or environmental science. For as long as they're seeing the results they want, they're really not applying sufficient rigor. Is that fair? I would say so. Um, Steve McIntyre, who ran Climate Audit, who was also a central figure in ClimateGate, Mm. talked about this. And one of the things he talked about, it it's the same effect with a different phrase. He called mm. it noble cause corruption. Yeah. yeah. And basically the idea here is, is that, well, I'm saving the planet. I mean, mm. I'm doing something noble and mm. important. And, you know, it doesn't matter that maybe my data is a little off or my methods are a little wonky, you know, or, uh, I'm saving the planet and what That's I'm right. getting as results is far more important than some of these details. Yeah. And I, I, I have come to believe that that is a far more pervasive problem than, than most lay people would, would care to admit. And to be fair, there is a certain amount of blame that belongs at the feet of the media here because you see the headlines and then you read the report that the headlines are based on and, and often they're quite badly mismatched. The level of confidence expressed in the media, of course, can be, can be quite absurd. You mentioned earlier you have had some media coverage uh, of certain incidents and certain sites and so forth as part of the surface stations project overall though and and i know there's some media coverage surrounding the the update that you've just released through uh, with the heartland institute overall though what's the what's the media's attitude towards the revelations that you've found actually being they're they find it curious but unbelievable yeah um you know it's, um... it's too absurd yeah, they, they can't get past the fact that, well, I'm not a credentialed climate scientist, first of all, so therefore I shouldn't be listened to. And apparently yeah. I take millions of dollars every month from big oil. So that just <laughs> excludes me right there, you know. And um, I wish know. big oil, if you're watching, we'd both like to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> and so they find reasons to ignore it. Um, I will say in almost every case, though, when I talk to a reporter, they say, you know, those pictures that you've got, those are really something. They're funny, but they don't grasp the significance. Um, and I will serious? say this. I spent, I have spent 35 years in radio and television and also some time in print. Mm. And during my time in radio and television, I was always the go-to guy for any kind of science questions that reporters have. Reporters sure. generally do not understand science well or mathematics well. And so their mm. ability to comprehend it, but more importantly, even question it, is mm. essentially zero. They just don't mm. have the skills. Mm. They just have to take what they're take what they're given, and we're seeing the consequences of that, unfortunately, playing out in both climate change as well as um, you know responses to the the coronavirus and various other things. So, what we haven't got to, and I've I've been holding back on this deliberately, is you ran an analysis on the climate stations, the surface stations, and you, without stealing your thunder, you divided them into three categories five into five categories excuse me and th to me what you found should have been the end of the story should have that that exploded everything to me at least to my mind so would you share with us what that analysis was well the 
the categories were not something that I invented. This is actually formed by a fellow by the name of Michael Leroy from Medio France, which is the, the French Meteorological Agency, kind of like okay. your BOM. Yep. And he had he had created this measurement system to define the quality of station sighting. And he actually yeah. did it back in 1999. And it was used as the basis for creating the climate reference network in the United States that I spoke of earlier. Yep. Yep. It was used to basically ascertain that these stations are far enough away from any influencing surfaces, bricks, concrete, asphalt, that sort of thing. Yeah. And so it was used then. And so this was not something I just came up with out of thin air. I applied sure. that metric to the study. And when we first went and did the analysis and published our own peer-reviewed paper in 2011, mm. we found, yes, there was an effect, but it wasn't as big as we thought it was going to be. Um, and what we did find that there was a no century scale trend in what's called the diurnal variation, meaning the differences between the high and the low during the day. We, we found right. that to be f flat for the best stations, whereas yeah. with the other stations, they were increasing. But yeah. the results were not dramatic. Mm -hmm. And so the, the original study that we put out there was somewhat dismissed because it didn't have, you know, that big headline that, that yeah, you know, the media sure. was looking for. Interestingly sure. enough, though, Leroy found out about what we were doing and revised his standard and published on it. And he came up with a second standard, which had to do with, OK, not only is distance between where the station is and where the asphalt is important, but the surface area, the amount of asphalt and mm. the distance to the station are the real measure. Because if you think wow. about it, let's say you're out in, uh, in, the, in the summertime and you've got uh, a concrete block. It's J big. And you put it in mm. the sun, right? And it heats up during the day. And then you take it at night and you let's say you want to haul it over and see what its effect is on a thermometer. And you put it 10 feet from a thermometer. Well, one concrete mm. block you know, of a surface area of about a square foot next mm -hmm. to a thermometer isn't going to have a lot of effect but sure. you multiply that by a thousand times and you've got a parking lot next yeah. to a thermometer at 10 feet away now all of a sudden you have a tremendous effect and that's yeah. how we quantified it and then when we took it and did it again did the analysis mm -hmm. again and published on it in 2015 lo and behold a very clear signal emerged and the fact of the matter is, is that we discovered is that this, the well-sighted stations, the ones that have not been corrupted, not placed next to these uh, influencing uh, heat surfaces and so forth, have mm -hmm. a warming rate of about half of all the other stations. Yeah. So in other words, what we're measuring largely, you know, half of the warming that we're, that, that we're supposedly seeing is being talked about in the uh, IPCC's ARs, et cetera, uh, is actually because we're building concrete and encroaching on the locations where these sites are. It's not actually because the atmosphere itself is warmed. Right. We're basically measuring how humans have changed their own local environment. Yeah. And I will point out this is not exclusive to cities. This, yeah. this kind of problem can happen literally out in the most remote places that mm. you can imagine. Um, during my most recent tour, I uh, went and traveled throughout Oregon, uh, Washington State, Nevada, places like that. Mm. There was a place in Nevada that I stumbled across. I didn't even know there was a station there. I was driving between Boise, Idaho, and mm. um, Winnemucca, Nevada. And there's this lonely road with literally nothing on it. And I'm driving, and I see there's this, this little compound coming up. And I notice it's like uh, it's got some trucks uh, for road maintenance on it. And it's got mm -hmm. a little hut there for the, the groundskeeper or whatever to live in. And I'm driving by and I noticed right out of the corner of my eye, wait a minute, there's a there's a NOAA station there. I could see it. I recognize the equipment. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going down the road at 65 miles an hour. And I <laughs> put on the brakes and did a U-turn. Went and looked at this because I didn't expect to find one there. It was total serendipity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked at it and then I, I had... Uh, um, my laptop and I had a, a cell phone link and Google Earth with the internet. And I looked at, at it from aerial view. Mm. I couldn't get into it because it was behind a fence. But bottom line is this, <clears throat> this little way station for railroad maintenance was 30 miles away from any other habitation, yeah. literally as in the middle of nowhere as you can be in, the, in Nevada, right? But they had this weather station there used to measure climate. And it was right next to this giant parking lot for 
the road maintenance department, black asphalt mm -hmm. and everything else. There was this little patch of grass in front of the, the caretaker's hut where they put the sensor. And then there's this giant, like, you know, 200 by 200 yards piece of asphalt next to it. And, so, and this... And this is the problem. You, you take that to a journalist, and they're, they're they're going to assume that couldn't possibly be true. That's so absurd. <laughs> that is so idiotic. That couldn't possibly be true. But it is true. I've seen it. I've documented it. And people that are, do not have closed minds understand this. Mm. Yeah. So this, you know, I sometimes get accused of, of drilling down really deeply into these little side issues that don't matter. But... The, the, the faith, and I use that word deliberately, the faith in climate change that has been, uh, or the faith of climate change that has been popularized now and, and pushed through media, through governments, through, uh, I would say, um, pseudoscience, but anyway, that's uh, that's a, a discussion for another day, uh, is almost universal now. It's It, it really feels as though there, there is barely a government in the world that isn't enthralled to, to the whole theory. And it's led to some really, really awful science and led to some really, really awful, um, I guess, beliefs. And and I know very close to your heart with the Californias, sorry, the Californias, the fires that went through um, Northern California. And uh, you had the, the, the wildfires um, quite close to Chico is my understanding. It was- Yes, um, I, I was watching it from my home uh, and I was watching the cloud and I had- employees for my little company that lived there. Uh, I had um, three people that lived in Paradise, California, and they all came to my office. You know, they lost their homes. Mm. And so I'll never forget that day. Mm. There are some just truly horrific stories that I, I, I won't repeat here. Uh, it's it's not the point. But it, it for, for those uh, Australians who may not be aware, uh, California is one of the other places on earth where they can get wildfires that uh, that are a, a match for ours. There's um, there's only a handful of places in the world where it can really go nuts the way that it can here. And, and California, with their their tall um, forests, can uh, they can really, really, really go up. So what I do want to talk about with that particular fire, though, is the politics surrounding it. Because this is one of the events, like the wildfires that we had here in, in Australia in, in late 2019, uh, this is an event that people point to and say, see, that's proof of climate change. <laughs> can you talk me through what you've learned? Because I've I've been following you on Facebook and obviously I see what you post from time to time. Can you talk me through what you've learned and what you know to be true as to why these fires were as bad as they were and why they happened in the first place? Okay, well, I would also like to point out that just a year before, in that same area, we had a massive flood and a, and a dam rupture, to, well, not a rupture, but uh, a threat to the dam, Oroville Dam, which yeah. you may have also seen in the I, headlines. I remember, I remember, yeah. That was in the same locale within about five know. to eight miles of the giant fire that went through Paradise. And, you know, one year we had more water than what we knew what to do with. The dams couldn't hold it, right? Mm. The next year we didn't get any water mm. and everything dried out. Mm. And in both cases, the media and the activists were out there saying, well, this, this water that's going to break the dam, that's proof of climate change. This yeah. drought that's causing the fire, well, that's proof of climate change. They yeah. were trying to have it both ways. And it was absurd. And they wouldn't and listen to reason. We've got the exact same thing because we had devastating fires in late 2019, um, genuinely heartbreaking, um, but, you know, without being callous, not setting a new record in any form. We've historically, we know within the last 200 years in Australia, we've had more extensive fires. We've had, um, the, the, you know, similar and worse experiences. Now, this year, we've just had a series of floods on the east coast of Australia. And again, the floods themselves were not unprecedented. In some places, the fact that they've had three floods now, that's the first time on that we have a record of that happening in, in such a short space of time. So uh, people love to use the word unprecedented. Technically, yes, some of what we've seen with this flooding is unprecedented. But the actual height of the floods is well below historic levels. In fact, it's not right. even a one in 100. I remember flood. writing an article about it, about Bisbrun. The, yeah. In Brisbane, they they had this flood, but it was nowhere near the, the historic record. No, uh, same thing. Yeah, and again, without being callous, you, you come down to Singleton, which is just a little bit north of of Sydney. Uh, they had a, a devastating flood. Even from memory, I may have the numbers slightly wrong. 
uh, it, it reached about 14.4 meters AHD, uh, which was enough to cause an enormous amount of destruction and was the first time they'd seen a flood at that level for about 40 years. However, the one in 100 flood level marked at the bridge in, in, in that town uh, is 17.7 meters, 3.3 meters higher. That is the engineer's best estimation of a one in 100 year flood. A 14.4 meter flood is around about a one in 20, one in 25 year flood. It just so mm -hmm. happens that they hadn't had one for 40 years. And a lot of people had built a lot of infrastructure and spent a lot of money right. onto those floodplains that then uh, is, is what was washed away. But yes, again, if you build on a floodplain, you're going to get flooded eventually. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's not it's, a matter of if, it's yeah. when. There's, there's a reason why that floodplain exists. There was flooding. But back to the topic at hand, again, we saw fires, climate change, floods, mm -hmm. climate change. I'm sure you'd be at least uh, somewhat familiar with the news that's come out recently about the Great Barrier Reef. And the Before fact we that, get to the Great Barrier Reef, yeah. there's one thing I want to say about the fires in California. Yeah. And, and this is really important. It has to do with fuel load more than anything else because the maintenance of the forest have stopped and they were stopped mm -hmm. by an environmental act that was protecting a species called the spotted owl, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you wanna go back onto my uh, Facebook page or website and find the graph and, and put it up here when you do this in post editing, I, I created a graph showing a timeline between the the passage of the act protecting the mm. spotted owl versus mm. the amount of timber that's been logged in California. Mm. And there was, you know, the amount of timber being logged in California was going up and up and up. And then all of a sudden the spotted owl comes along as a mm. law and the timber goes down like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not only were they not harvesting any timber, but they were also preventing any kind of maintenance of the forest. You couldn't uh, you know, clear brush, get rid of mm -hmm. invasive species, anything. Mm -hmm. They basically mm -hmm. just turned the forest into a un, uh, an unmanaged tinderbox. And yeah. that is part of the reason, not the entire reason, but a good portion of the reason why California has such severe fires now. And and uh, anyone familiar with uh, with me, I haven't talked about it in the last couple of years because other topics have come along. Um, but certainly after the Black Saturday fires and um, you know prior and after the um, the most more recent fires in Victoria and, and New South Wales, talking about the same problem, we have the same problem, and it's it's so absurd here that people are not even allowed to go and collect firewood from the side of the road. And they are actually restricted from removing trees from their own property. And so every year we have this government funded campaign, you know, are you fire ready? Do you have your fire plan? Have you cleaned your gutters? Have you done this? Have you done that? And yet at the same time, local councils are saying, no, you can't cut down that massive tree that's overhanging your house and would come crashing down if it caught do, fire. Do they have amnesty programs for turning in illegal firewood? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well played, well played. Um, yeah, in one case, there was a particular town uh, that was absolutely no fires. Uh, and this is this is now going back uh, 10, 11, 11 odd years, I, I, if my memory serves. Um, and there was one individual in that town who had been fined a sum in the order of tens of thousands of dollars for breaking the law by cutting down a tree that he believed was a fire hazard. And if, again, if my memory serves, I didn't, I wasn't expecting to be talking about this. So I, I haven't re refreshed my memory, but if my memory serves, he had gone to the council, asked for permission to cut this tree down, been denied, then gone ahead and said, you know what? The safety of my family is more important. I'm cutting it down anyway. And when the Black Saturday fires went through, his was the only house standing. And there were people that perished in the other houses on that street. I remember street the story. Down. So, the, you know, again, this is this is stuff that has very real consequences. It's ideological. It's it's sort of arcane. It's easy to say, oh, that doesn't affect me. But this has very very real consequences. Do you are, are you inclined to touch on the role of PG and E in in the fires there? Yes, um, I can tell you a lot about PG and E in the sense of they have become. Um, at first, they were a parasitic, I would describe as a parasitic organization. But now... For, for, those, um, for those that don't know, they are a, a power production and, and distribution. Right. Pacific company. Gas and Electric. And they are the yeah. largest utility provider for electric and gas services in California. They cover mm. uh, over two-thirds of the state. Uh, mm. There are some other smaller um, 
uh, power outlets such as San Diego Power and Edison Power in Southern California. But PG&E is the, the big dog of all of the power companies in California. Mm. And when the um, Global Warming Solutions Act was passed in 2006 in California, uh, AB 32, uh, signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, the, um, the power company went berserk and started embracing this, saying that, you know, we have to um, do our part to um, make our electric production green. And mm. so they put millions upon millions of dollars into wind turbines and other types of green power projects and totally, completely ignored maintenance of the most basic electric infrastructure. And this is exactly what caused the giant fire for Paradise, California in 2018. Mm. They had a, 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 um, a high voltage power line that ran through the Feather River Canyon uh, about 25 miles away from me. I've been through that canyon dozens of times, wonderful scenic route. And these power transmission towers were along the side of the canyon, perched on the side of the canyon, drilled into the rock. And they'd been there since like 1915. Very, yeah. very old towers, right? They have a special, um, you know, they have insulators that come down from the towers that hold the wires. Yeah. So there's a, a, a little hook about this big made of metal, made of iron, called a C-hook which basically keeps the wire connected to the insulator. Mm. And they had had a report from their linemen two years earlier that the sea hooks on this that were approaching, they were 100 years old at this point practically, needed to be replaced because they were deteriorating, they were rusting, they were, mm. they were fatiguing, all of the different problems that happen with metal that ages. And PG&E mm. did nothing about it. They knew about it. They did nothing about it. And so what happened on that day in 1918 when the fire roared through, no, there was a tremendous yeah. wind that went through the canyon. Tremendous mm. wind because we had a big high pressure system east and it pushed all of that pressure as wind right down through the canyon, causing you know winds of 75 miles per hour or more. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, flapping the lines and whatever. And eventually one of those sea hooks broke it slammed the line into the side of the tower. It grounded. It made a big shower of sparks that landed on the ground. The winds picked up that fire and just drove it like a blowtorch right through paradise. Mm. Had nothing to do with climate change. Not one damn thing. And I think I already know the answer to this, and it's similar to the answer here in Australia for the people responsible. But are they actually being held responsible in any meaningful way? Not in a meaningful way. They have paid fines. And they have, um, you know, admitted their guilt and killings 80 plus people in that fire. Mm. To the credit of the CEO of PG&E a couple of years ago, they, that CEO came to the courtroom in Butte County and stood there before the judge while all the names of the dead were read and um, pleaded guilty to each charge. But no one went to jail. The company is still operating. It never went into bankruptcy. Mm. And they're still pushing their green agenda. And so literally nothing has changed. Yeah, nothing. The lesson hasn't been learned. Yeah, nothing material has really changed. And the yeah. other problem is PG&E has become not just uh, parasitic, but they've become, you know, they're actually after people. Um, th there's a, a geographic problem associated with PG&E. People that live on the coast that have moderate temperatures that don't change very much where most of the people in California live, they don't pay very much to PG&E because they don't have to deal with large temperature swings. But sure. in, the, in the interior valleys where the temperatures can range from 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, mm. you know, over 40 degrees centigrade, down to the freezing point or lower in the wintertime, mm. these people have to pay huge amounts of money for heating and cooling. And PG&E sure. has tiered in the summertime the power rates such that the more power you use, the more you're penalized. It costs yeah. you more. And yeah. at some point during certain situations, the cost for a kilowatt hour of electricity in California approaches a dollar, where mm -hmm. the national average is something like 11, 14, 11 cents to 14 cents. Yeah. 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 Well, we're, um, we're averaging in Victoria about 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that's not the peak. Obviously, the peaks can be considerably higher than that. Um, it can be many times that, in fact. So we, we'd probably be reaching similar peaks at the absolute worst case scenarios. 
Um, and our grid is also becoming less reliable. We're, we're certainly experiencing more sort of brownouts. And just recently, we had uh, the, a, a crisis on the east coast of Australia with uh, all of us being warned that we had to cut back on our electricity usage. Otherwise, there were going to be wide, widespread blackouts, etc. And this is in the context, of course, of a country that plans to shut down its six remaining coal-fired power plants, because apparently us removing six coal-fired power plants is going to save the world uh, <laughs> when China plans to build uh, more than a 1,000 new ones uh, in, in just the next couple of decades. What's going on here when when... There's such good information like what you've provided about that, that calls into question the the, the data, the uh, the temperature data. When th there's so much absurdity around us, we mentioned the Great Barrier Reef earlier. There's good news about the Great Barrier Reef. There's a huge amount of new uh, coral growing and bouncing back. In right. fact, it's the most coral they've ever measured. And then out comes the media and says, this is terrible. They're all just new vulnerable corals. It's just the fast growing varieties of coral. And of course, you apply a, a moment of logic to that and say, well, what did you expect that over two years, you're going to see a whole bunch of hundred year old corals grow back? Like what's, you know, do you want the coral to grow back or don't you? <laughs> Leave it to the media and academia to find a lead lining in these clouds. Okay. But this is, this is kind of my next question for you. Are we up against anything scientific or are we actually up against there, there's just a certain type of person that just wants there to be that they want a doomsday that's what it's starting to feel like to me it yes it is it, it's a strange thing you would think that when people like dr peter Ridd point mm -hmm. out that the reef is doing great you know mm -hmm. that it's higher than ever or the amount of growth is in, increasing mm -hmm. more than ever and uh, you know the problems that you're associating with climate change are really something to do with runoff from farming or other problems associated with that you would think that people would be overjoyed phew it's not that but in fact they're actually angry when you point these things out yeah i have been the i've been the brunt of all sorts of, of i'm sure you have. for pointing mm -hmm. out the fact that Yes, the temperature is going up, but it's not going up at this catastrophic rate if you look at the mm. good weather stations. Mm. And they get mm. angry when we talk mm. about that. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you, some kind of a heretic or something? You know, that's the <laughs> kind of thing that they 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 label me with. Mm. And I'm just trying to point out the obvious. I follow the data, just like mm. Dr. Peter Ridd did. He followed the yeah. data. And he was fired from his position for pointing out that the data that was being published out of Townsville from the university of there, uh, Cook University, uh, was, James was, Cook. Was, yep. Flood. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, he had the temerity to say that the university's um uh I can't quality the control. Name, but their 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 quality control in their reef division, that's not the proper name for it, but their reef division quality control um was flawed. And um that of course has since been confirmed because multiple people now who worked at the reef division have gone on to work at other universities that have much higher levels of quality control and have since had to retract papers or in some cases actually been uh, been done and been dismissed for for um, unethical practices, malpractice within within the, their own studies. So other universities are finding issues with the work of the very same individuals that James Cook University happily uh, employed and and never never found right. fault with. So I, I think Dr. Peter Ridd's um, actions are going to age very very well with time, but that doesn't make it any easier for him in terms of the price that he's had to pay. Give me a, an insight, if you will, and I I, I remember when I visited you. Um, that um, you know, obviously, as in as an American, you have the right to keep and bear arms. And um, I remember my I, I'm very comfortable with that, by the way, and I, I actually quite like it. Uh, but my crew, I had two camera crew with me at the time. Uh, this was a bit of a newer concept to them. And uh, you had something on display in your office um, that um, you know I won't, <laughs> I won't go into detail on. Um, and and you made a reference to it, and you said that it was an, a, an unfortunate necessity, given that you're not exactly popular in some circles. What's been some of the impact on you and your family for daring to be a heretic? Well, yes, I am. Ne Before I started in the climate change business, I had never owned a weapon in my life. I had done some shooting in the Boy Scouts, you know, and maybe went out with the guys one time and did some some shooting at the local shooting range, but I was never a, a gun owner. Mm. However, since I started into the climate change uh, issue and started publishing things that people don't like, mm. and I've had people show up at my office and scream at me. I've had people write me nasty letters. People leave nasty messages on my phone, mm. anonymous emails, threatening me, all kinds of different things. Yes, now I'm a gun owner. And um, 
I advertise that fact from mm. time to time on my Facebook page. I post mm. up a picture of my target practice, you know, <laughs> and I let it be known that to yeah. those folks out there that, you know, I am a responsible gun owner and I learn how to use it safely. I practice with it. And that sends the message that it's like, don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to send the same message here because uh, I've been on the receiving end of uh, some interesting communications over the years. Um, but unfortunately, our, our culture over here in Australia takes a, uh, a very different view. They, uh, they think that you should just die and, and have the police show up and draw a chalk outline around you rather than to have the, the, the horror of someone actually protecting themselves. Anyway, that's a different story for a different time. So where to from here? You've just had uh, the sort of the republication of the the surface stations project through the Heartland Institute. That's making some waves. Um, I, I did see uh, it was mentioned in a letter to the editor of a newspaper, and then it's been attacked now. And was it the Washington Post have had a crack at you? Yep. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here briefly and show you something. This is, um, can you see it? Yeah, yeah. I've just got to bring it on. I'll add that to the stream. Yep. There we go. Okay. So let me close some of my windows here. <laughs> so that we so can, can focus see. on that. I've got too many windows. But this here, this is the latest publication that uh, we produced out of the Heartland Institute yep. called Corrupt, Corrupted Climate Station. Yep. This is the latest report. And it's it's written like a scientific paper in lots of ways. It's, it's written in a way that is readable by the layman, but contains yep. scientific references. And I, here's that famous station that I talked about in Marysville yeah. uh, you know, in the parking lot. Here's the famous one at the University of Tucson in front of the Atmospheric Sciences Department in the parking lot. We've got dozens of examples of this. <laughs> but I want to show you the most important thing right here is this yeah. graph. Yeah. Okay. This graph is our analysis. And this analysis shows that we looked at all the stations in the United States that we could you know, get to. And the worst stations, uh, the worst sighted stations, are in the orange and in the red. Mm. The best sighted stations, which are not encroached upon by asphalt, concrete, or whatever, are in the blue. Mm. And there's a trend difference of almost 50% between mm. the good stations and the bad stations. Yeah, That right there is the result. And that result basically says that the blue rate of warming we do not have a climate crisis. Yeah. And of course, this is what they, they do bang on about, uh, is the the rate of warming. You, when you argue, hang on, these temperatures aren't unprecedented. We've seen this historically. We've seen uh, levels of atmospheric CO2 in excess of 2,000 parts per million. There's so much of what we're seeing that isn't unprecedented. The big comeback is, but the rate of warming is unprecedented. That, that for me, at least in my experience, has been what a lot of people have, have then used to, to defend um, you know, they won't listen to the fact that wildfires are actually reduced, floods are actually reduced, hurricanes are actually reduced, the reef is fine, islands aren't drowning, et cetera. So none of that matters. The rate of warming. Uh, and so your research to me really cuts to the heart of probably the the one thing that, that global warming believers, uh, at least the, the laymen amongst the global warming believers, really believe they have in their corner is the rate of warming. We've never seen this before. Now, I don't think that's even true, even if their numbers were correct, but their numbers simply aren't correct. But how do we, how do we, where do we go from here? Because we have this information and you've been screaming this from the rooftop since 2007. Um, you know, I've, I've joined in in my own small way. There are, there are many incredible people. You mentioned um, um, uh, Roger Pielke uh, Jr. A, a minute ago, you know, whether it's Michael Schellenberger now, even Hans Rosling, you know, he was, he was a, a believer in the whole climate change proposition, but he just brought logic and facts and demographics and statistics to the argument. And yet we don't, seem to be cutting through what's 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 the piece that's missing do you have any insight as to what we would need to do you know that's a really excellent question one that i don't have a solid answer to because the biggest problem that we have is that we're up against climate change has become a business unto its own right okay yes. there are billions of dollars flowing into climate change research. You know, yeah. there there was huge amounts of money flowing into the barrier reef research, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. huge amounts of money flowing into climate models and computers to make climate models and so forth. It's people are building business empires mm -hmm. around climate change. And here's the problem. And here's why they get so mad when we point out things aren't really as bad as they like to make it out to be. Mm. We're cutting into their money. It's simple <laughs> as that. 
when when you say, you know what, it's not warming at this catastrophic rate. Here's the data that proves it. They don't want to look at it because if there's no problem that they can't scream to their elected representatives, members of Congress, whatever, the parliament, mm. you know, we've got this catastrophic problem. We need to throw money at it. We need mm. money for research. We need money, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then their whole world of yeah. business collapses. That's the problem that it's become. You know, it's just, it just a, a fascinating thing. And they can't get out of this. Because mm. it's the whole publisher Paris mentality on steroids. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Well, I, I get I get tickled when people accuse me of being a grifter because I'm trying to sell T-shirts or, or these sorts of things. They're <laughs> like, oh, you're just in it for the money. And I just, like, you can't even argue with them because they, they're not going to talk to you for long enough and they're not going to think deeply enough to actually get it. But do you realize that every university, you know, many, many researchers, enormous... Uh, non-government agencies both un as well as as well as external would cease to exist if this problem went away uh it's, it's a little bit like you, you see you see organizations like greenpeace and i forget his name but one of the founders of greenpeace um has since left the organization and is now uh one of its critics and um he's, patrick he's moore. sorry dr patrick moore patrick moore that's right thank you um and he's done that on the basis that he's sort of saying well we set out to solve a bunch of problems. Those problems have kind of been solved. And now we're looking for problems that are really quite marginal and, and we don't necessarily have good data. But we're not really sure that it is a problem. In some cases, we're making stuff up. Um, you know, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but broadly speaking, he's he's walked away from the organization that he actually started. Um, but the organization has to survive. I mean, if homelessness actually went away, all of the homeless, all the charities helping homeless people would disappear. If, if, if skin cancer disappeared, the Cancer Council of Australia would all be out of a job. I mean, these people, they want to help or be seen to be helping, but they don't actually want to fix the problem, do they? No, it's it's like they're, it's much more profitable to treat the symptoms than to cure the disease. I mean, if climate change is a disease, it's much more profitable to treat the symptoms through research mm. or, or whatever mm. in activism. Mm. And that's really what's going on here. Mm. Well, you, you you could have said the exact same thing about the pharmaceutical companies and uh, and governments and all sorts of organizations, unfortunately. So I want to turn to American politics for a moment, if if you're okay with that. Um, I don't I don't sure. I haven't interviewed a lot of Americans up to this point in time. Um, now I was in the US in the lead up to the 2016 election. I went over there with my wife, um, and having been on the ground, we came away and, and very much predicted a Trump win because we we felt that those who were voting for Hillary were being very loud and proud about it, and those who were voting for Trump wouldn't advertise the fact. But us being Australians, they'd get to know us a little bit, and then you know we'd get to American politics, because I would always make sure we did, uh, and they'd kind of look over their shoulder and make sure no one was, was watching, and then they'd, <laughs> they'd whisper, actually, I'm going to be voting for Trump. And what we realized, of course, was in, in that context that the polls couldn't possibly be right. Now, that, that played out, and Trump did win that election. I then went on to predict that he was going to win again in 2020 on the basis of the economic performance and a number of other indicators that are usually pretty reliable at seeing whether a president will get returned or not. Uh, that didn't prove to be the case. Now we've got some crazy stuff going on. The FBI raids on Mar-a-Lago. It's, it's fully expected, at least in the media over here, it's fully expected that Trump is going to try and run again. Uh, we've got President Biden, who sometimes seems very lucid and with it and on it, and sometimes really does not. Um, you know, we've got various flashpoints around the world, Ukraine being one example, Taiwan heating up again. I'm kind of looking at America going, come on, guys, get you get your act together. <laughs> what's what's going on over there? Well, right now there is a systemic concerted effort to prevent Trump from running in 2024. It's yeah. just that simple. And this FBI raid was a method that they thought they could pull off where if they could find some secret documents that he's not supposed to have in his possession, mm -hmm. then he would be in violation uh, of, you know, the Espionage Act or something else, Records Act, something of that uh, mm -hmm. type. And then, therefore, uh, he could be convicted of that and then would be ineligible for running for president again. Right. That's really what's going on here. They are so mm -hmm. afraid of him because the man basically went into Washington and he gutted things like the Environmental Protection Agency. He completely okay. gutted the place, you know. And again, we're cutting into their money. That's what it's mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And and huge amounts of money uh, for salaries and everything disappeared. He, you know, 
they're afraid he's going to do that again, and he's going to do it with a vengeance. So they're doing everything they can to prevent it. But there's a double standard going on. I mean, the kind of thing that, that they're accusing Trump of doing, well, they've had other people like Hillary and her emails and her private mm-hmm. server mm-hmm. and all these other mm-hmm. things. There, it, so it's clearly when, when Trump says it's a witch hunt, that's an understatement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it it, it strikes me. I mean, even putting aside Hillary, which we shouldn't, I think that's a very relevant point, but even putting her aside for a moment, we still don't know who visited um, uh, Epstein's Epstein's island. Island, Yes. Okay. Now that information exists. It does. You know, it is known by uh, it. it, That was that was speculation that Trump had that information in the safe. So, you know, we, we know the contents of, of the inside of Trump's safe, but we don't know the contents of that little black book that would seem to me to be very relevant and interesting to anyone interested in upholding the law and protecting children and minors. You would think that, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. You remember, people are making careers out of being politicians. You know, you look yeah. at a, a senator or a congressman, who is living in a multi-million dollar mansion and they have a salary that's on the order of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And you wonder, mm-hmm. how did we get from 200,000 or so a year as your salary mm-hmm. up to a multi-million dollar mansion? How did that happen? Mm-hmm. And it's systemic. That kind of stuff is happening in the US Congress and Senate. Yeah. So how do we, is there a way, as I look forward into the future, you know, one of the things that concerns me the most, and certainly I, I don't know how across you are, what's happened in Victoria with all the lockdowns and my role in opposing the lockdowns and so forth, but we've become a much more divided society than what we were previously. People have picked sides, drawn battle lines, and it's it's gotten quite ugly at times. I feel like that's playing out just in everyday American politics right now. There's really yeah. There really is a drawing of battle lines between the, the self-identified left, the self-identified right, um, you know, and... and uh, is there a way back from this? What what has to happen for the United States to become united again? Well, I think that the internet has been one of the most dividing factors in it all because it allows people to become tribal by joining different types of websites or, mm-hmm. or chat rooms and so forth, where they can, without any threat of retribution or exposure or risk in, in a social way, they can mm. flame someone. They can talk about how much they hate Trump or they hate yeah. Biden or who, yeah. whatever. And so the the internet caters to a tribal mentality to allow mm. people to be one or the other. And that's really what's happened in the United States. We've become tribal. You know, mm. it's it's, you know, the Democrats versus the Republicans or the conservatives versus the liberals. And it's yeah. really about two tribes warring with each other. That's what it's boiled down to. How do you solve that? I'm not a sociologist, so I don't yeah. know. But I do know this, that people that spend more time on the internet are often the worst at this, and they mm-hmm. often become the most tribal because this this ability to be anonymous, and you've experienced this too, allows them to project themselves onto people making threats, like you and I mm-hmm. have received threats, without mm-hmm. any fear of retribution. And so it caters yeah. to the most base human instincts to lash out and do so without retribution. Yeah. So the U.S. economy, uh, according to Joe Biden, miracle of miracles, uh, has not experienced any inflation last month. Uh, it's quite a, quite an astonishing turnaround after being in excess of 5%. Um, you'd be familiar, I'm sure, with uh, yeah. if we were calculating inflation the same way that we did back in the 1980s before we started fiddling with the formula, U.S. inflation would be, I believe, north of 17% at the moment, I, I believe, is where that one comes down. What's well, about right? Yeah, well, I was going to say, what, what does it actually feel like to you? What's what's the reality on the ground? I mean, you're in California. That is its own little bubble. Um, however, what's the reality for you? Well, the reality is, is that certain things that I used to do and other people used to do aren't being done anymore. People are they're traveling less mm-hmm. because the gas price, gasoline prices are so high. Uh, they are buying less in terms of um, things that are uh treats or uh pleasures you know people aren't going to the movies as much uh people are not going out to amusement parks as much Mm -hmm. things that are not uh, necessities are being cut back and so that affects the travel industry it affects the entertainment industry a whole bunch of other associated support industries for that uh because people are holding their money close to their chest because Mm -hmm. they're afraid they're not going to be able to either pay their electric or gas bill Mm. fill up their automobile for travel to get to work or Mm. buy groceries and feed their family. 
those are the real things that they're worried about here. And in the meantime, you know, we've got politicians telling us that we have to change our lifestyle or we're going to burn up the planet, you know, but people can't buy their, you know, can't buy groceries some weeks. It's that yeah. kind of, of disconnect that's going on between American politics and the American citizen. Yeah, it's it's the old, uh, I, can't I, I can't afford fuel. Oh, well, you should just buy a Tesla, buy an electric car, you know, this... It, it really yes, is that's the, the prob, that's got to be the most absurd statement ever from a politician, <laughs> and, and that's a tough crowd <laughs> to find yes. the most absurd statement. <laughs> it's, it, it, we, we've we've got gone full circle and come back to a Marie Antoinette type of attitude from government. Let them eat cake. If they've you know they've run out of bread, we'll let them eat cake. Well, of course they don't have any cake, you idiot. If they did, they wouldn't have run out of bread yet, would they? Um, so, but but we've also it's it seems to me to be really based. On almost this resurgence of um, feudalism, uh, feudalism. But I, I want to go deeper than that. I, it's there's this resurgence of almost a a, a paganism, a uh, what do you call it? like witchcraft, etc. You know, you were talking before about how everyone points to climate change and says, "Oh, this is oh, this yeah. happened. It's climate change. That happened." It's I call it. I, I call it the universal boogeyman. Now, I yeah. mean, the, the, you can take climate change and any event on Earth that's happened. You know. Uh, you know, big wave, rock fall, earthquake, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. big tornado, anything. And no. the media will apply some kind of a climate change label to it. It's the and, universal and, boogeyman. And so the reason why I liken it to a, like a resurgence of, of superstition, that's that's what I'm looking for, a resurgence of there superstition, um, is it used to be that if you had something unexplained in your life, a smell in the house, noises, an illness, a skin condition, uh, a, you know, a run of deaths in the family, whatever it may be, there was a universal answer. You call the witch doctor and they tell you that you've got bad spirits and for a fee, they can fix it for you. <laughs> and I just, I just, no, I'm, 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 I mean, I know it's funny, but I'm actually being serious. I feel like the whole climate change industry has become the go-to witch doctor that we all are supposed to look at and say, why did that happen? Or oh, it was climate change. But you know what? If you just give us more funding, we can fix it for you. Yeah, you're right. Because, you know, the media will hype some event. Hurricane Sandy, for example. Sure. You know, with it hit New York City. Now, this thing entered as a category one storm when it hit the city, but it just had a a, a very strange um, a convergence of events. We had a high tide and a moon and all this stuff happening all at the same time. And so there was a flooding that they'd never seen before. Yeah. So Hurricane Sandy became Superstorm Sandy because, yeah. you know, it, it, where it hit. But it was really only a Category 1 storm, not particularly yeah. strong. It was just wide, and it produced a lot of water moving into the city. But, yeah. you know, we have had media that basically call the witch doctor and say, you know, if we only had more Teslas, if we only had less coal being burnt, if we only, yeah. you know, yeah. use less natural gas, we wouldn't yeah. have these problems. Yeah. That's the kind of witchcraft, witch doctor thing connection that you're talking about. I, I get struck often by the fact that, you know, when you actually, like the clues are all around us, the answers are all around us. I mentioned before the one in 100 year flood level, okay? You know, we, we understand that the longer the period of time, the more likely extreme weather events become. Right. And here in Australia, we don't have written records um, dating back more than a bit over 200 years, right? No, no one was taking measurements in any scientific capacity prior to that point in time. Which means that in we fact, have... the oldest temperature measurement that you have is in Sydney at the observatory there. Yes. I've been to that. I looked at the way they've measured temperature there. They happen to measure the temperature next to a brick wall, which <laughs> getting in sunlight. <laughs> um, but what strikes me is we have no idea in Australia what a one in 1,000 rain event looks like. One in 1,000 year. One in 1,000 year drought. One in 1,000 year wind storm. We have right. no idea what the impact of a one in 1,000 year solar storm would be if it were to hit Earth with all of our technology now. I mean, it's so incredibly arrogant of us to be sitting here going, oh, there's this slight change. It's it's this, it's gone from this to this. We we know nothing about what nature right. is capable the of. The only evidence you've got beyond further back than the direct measurements back at the observatory and so forth mm. are stories from the aboriginals. Correct. You know? They they have a, a generational memory of these big mm. events, but they mm. have no way to quantify it. You know, Correct. a big storm happened, you know, many, many years ago, and our ancestors described, you know, the flood or whatever, but there's yeah. no way to quantify it. But Correct. what we can say is that big events happened back then, and there's a generational memory of it. So what yeah. we're going through today is not unique. 
Yeah, and and then you get to proxy records and other things that can give us some insight into the past. And the minute you go to those, you can see uh, dramatic events, dramatic effects, uh, dramatic changes in climate, etc. So, from your point of view, um, Anthony, what's kind of next for you? Are you, have, are you are you putting the surface stations project on the shelf now that it's been updated and published, or is that going to be something you continue to pursue? Well, I can't really talk about it. Okay. But I have something even bigger in the works. Okay. I will just say this and leave it at that. All of the data that is produced in the United States, in the world, in Australia, everywhere, is, is collected and curated by the government. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, think about that. You know, and you think about how much do, do you trust often. the government, right? Yeah. How much do you trust the government to do the right thing? Yeah. So that is the biggest problem that we have. All of the data is measured and curated and distributed by the government. The average citizen has no other recourse. I'm going to work on that. You heard it here first, folks. That that sounds very interesting. Uh, having been following your work for a very long time and, and being an admirer of it, um, that sounds very interesting. I look forward to seeing what comes out of that. Well, Anthony, I'm, I'm going to have to wind it up there. Uh, for those that are, that are watching, it's the middle of the day here in Australia. Uh, I'm actually at home. The kids are here as well. Normally, I do these slow chats at night and I can go until who knows what time, but I can I can hear things escalating and uh, I need to go and go and, go and be, <laughs> be a dad for a little while. Um, but Anthony, this has been an absolute pleasure. And can I book in in advance when you are ready to talk about what you're working on? Would you come back and talk to me about it? I most certainly will. And I can guarantee you, it will be something never before attempted, and it will be unique. Well, there you go. Anthony, this has been such a pleasure. Great to see you again. Great to see that you've, you're powering on with the Surface Stations project. Uh, I have skimmed through the new Yeah, report. I couldn't I do it without those millions of dollars from Big Oil. I just couldn't. No, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that really got you over the line. Um, look, I, I look forward to reading it in detail. I haven't yet, but I skimmed through it, and, and it, it's just another great piece of work from you. So thank you so much, Anthony, and thank, thank you very you. much for your time. All righty. Bye-bye. Have a great night. You too. All righty. That was my pre-recorded slow chat with uh, Anthony Watts. I hope you've enjoyed that. I got to say, I I didn't know that he was going to tease me like that at the end, uh, but I am, I'm pretty excited actually. Um, what he, The work that he's already done has been pretty groundbreaking. So for him to be sitting there saying, um, you know, I'm going to do something that's even bigger and I'm going to deal with this problem where governments have control over all the information that we get. Well, color me interested. So stand by for a slow chat at some point in the future. I've no idea when. I don't know what his timeline is. Um, but at some point in the future, stand by for that. I will do another slow chat with Anthony Watts and we will update. Look, that's all I've got for you. Um, but do head over to brewaustralia.com today. Uh, sorry, not .com today, you just brewaustralia.com and become one of the supporters of this channel by subscribing to Brew Coffee. I've got a bit of news on that front. We will be shipping the first pack in the first week of October. So we've set a date. We're going for it. So if you've already signed up, thank you so much for doing that. You will get your first pack somewhere around the end of the first week or the middle of the second week of October. Um, and we'll be shipping monthly from there, of course. Um, if you haven't yet signed up, go to brewaustralia.com or find the Brew Australia excuse me, the Brew Australia Facebook and Instagram pages. Check us out and you can help me to do what I'm doing. And then once we pass that 250 minimum subscriber mark, then everyone from then on will get to choose who they want to support and you'll be able to support whichever freedom-friendly content creator you want to support. So go and check that out, brewaustralia.com. Um, I'm going to keep on doing what I do, regardless of what happens with Brew. Uh, I'm going to keep on churning out the great content that I try to bring to you as often as I can. Uh, in between the cinema showings, two kids, being a dad, pregnant wife, um, court cases, and all the other nonsense that goes on in my life, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be doing what I can to keep bringing you more slow chats. We've, uh, we've got some ideas with more content coming. I did have ambitions for a once a week YouTube release that has just proved to be too resource intensive for me at the moment. I don't have, it's a, it's a combination of, of the budget, the, the time in my life, the headspace to pursue that just at the minute. So we have been uh, looking at what I can do that's gonna perhaps bring a lot of value whilst demanding less resources from me. So stand by for that. Uh, and we should be launching something probably right about the time I wrap up the cinema showing. So mid-October thereabouts, 
uh, we should be wrapping up the cinema showings. And at that point, I should be releasing my next sort of project on YouTube uh, that you'll see. So uh, yeah, brewaustralia.com, thanks for those asking. Uh, if you want to support my work, and then once we have 250 subscribers, from there we'll be supporting other, or you'll be supporting other people's work. You'll get to choose who you support. It's not up to me. It's not about me having some budget that I can dole out to other people. It's about me creating a vehicle that you can use to support whoever you want to um, to use. Um, Paul, rats had missed that you had another kid on the way. Yeah, number three is on the way, Paul. So thanks for that. And thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that slow chat. Do share it. Do give it a like. Thank you for all the comments. It helps with the algorithm, etc. I really appreciate it. If you're not on the email list, you really need to be because that's the reliable way that I can communicate with you. So go to tofafield.net and make sure that you're on the email list there. But thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your night and I'll see you again shortly. Cheers.